podcast. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Give it a minute or so for people to start coming in. Hey, Kim. Hey, Tim. Eva. Sharon, good morning. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning, Kelly and Elaine. Um, yeah, we have a special edition today. Um, as we are going to be, uh, you're going to see here in a minute, we have um, Ashley Nelly and Dawn Graham in here with us. They're patiently waiting to come on screen. Good morning, Jennifer, Jill, Susie. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. And Sandy, Carol, Chris. Um, very excited. Like I said, this is our three-year anniversary. I can't believe I've been getting up every Sunday morning at well, I get up at six o'clock in the morning to prepare for this. <laughs> Good morning, Ray. Good morning, Dorothy. Um, yeah, so welcome. And um, if you know of anybody that this um, live stream could help, please feel free to share it with them. Good morning, Lynn from Canada and Tess. Hey, everybody. Um, got a couple things to share with you before we get started. So for those of you that don't know or may be new, um, who on here has been following us for the past three years every Sunday morning? It was just um, a crazy idea I had. I was just like, why wouldn't people want to see some of this training? Why don't I broadcast this? So I just decided to go live and do it. And we did start on Periscope. Um, and then I heard about this Facebook live streaming thing and said, I'm switching over to Facebook. Um, so, yeah, three years ago, we did start on Periscope for several months. And then a couple of months later, switched it over to um, Facebook. Good morning, Adrian. Hey, Sharon says me. Yes, Sharon, I do believe you have been with us all three years. And Susie, um, Carol says she's been here since day one. Julie has been following us or attending for the past year. So thank you. And Kim has been following. From, <laughs> that's right. Kim has been start following from the beginning on Periscope. Um, so, yeah, for those that may not know um, are new to the episode, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. Um, we are an international educational center uh, where we uh, broadcast via our live streams and help share with everybody how to live, love, and learn through working with animals using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. And you can find out more about us at our, on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Yay! Um, hey, Sue. Uh, and Sue says her first time loves Dawn Graham. Well, good. Um, you're going to see her here in a couple seconds. Hey, Bettina. And Pat says she's been following since day one. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, hopefully you're loving Coffee with the Critters and as much as I do. So let's go ahead and get started. And I am going to do a quick recap of the following week, which is going to be really quick because I only have a couple photos. <laughs> um, so I wasn't able to get any photos of volunteers this week. But what I did do is I want to update you on some training that we've been doing. Um, let me go ahead and get Coffee with the Critters off of here since everybody knows. And see if I can make myself smaller here. You think I'd, after three years of doing this, I'd, I'd know how to do this a lot quicker. So a couple of recap of what we've been doing this week. Um, those of you in the pig project have seen how we are teaching Milo, um, our pig, to shut the door. So you can see here there's Cello, our roller pigeon. Um, what happens is I usually have my hands full. I walk into different rooms and Cello, our roller pigeon, who is extremely smart, knows that I leave the door open. And next thing I know, I have a roller pigeon in a room behind me, which I don't mind. But for safety reasons, it's probably not best that he be in the bird room. So I've taught Milo to whenever he sees an open door, go over and shut it. So I thought, why not? I need an extra helping hand around here. And um, 
it's working out great. So yesterday I left the door open and boom, I heard it shut. So we want to keep that on a continuous schedule of reinforcement, meaning every time it happens, um, the behavior is reinforced. And secondly, um, those of you that have been following our work um, in the Parrot Project, um, this is Murray, our soon to be 14 year old green wing macaw. He was one that um, I let my relationship go with him. And by that, I mean, um, I stopped training him because the volunteers were training him instead. And our relationship went south pretty, not fast, but over a period of a year. And what I saw was um, he didn't want me around him anymore. He showed that to me through his body language. And I was like, this is sad for me. So I stepped in and started training him again. I was not able to pick him up. Um, and this is a, through a series of steps. This is a photo I took of he and I yesterday. So I'm now able to pick him up without the use of a perch. And um, so that's I'm very happy with that progress. OK, let me go ahead and bring Dawn and Ashley on here with me. Um, this is our first time doing. Um, I don't want to say it, it, it's a discussion, not an interview. Um, let me go ahead and bring Ashley on. There's Ashley. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I've disappeared. Let's see. <laughs> let me bring. Don't let me be bring. On here alone. <laughs> Take over the show. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm bringing on Dawn. Yes. Hey. Hey. So um, let me go ahead and put your names up. Um, We'll start with the left. This is Don Graham out of um, Oklahoma. Um, mm -hmm. and Don, you're a member of the Parrot Project. You're, are you also a, a, a member, the Animal Behavior Center? No, just the Parrot Project. Okay. Okay. Um, and then at, uh, um, Don is a parrot trainer and rehabber out of Oklahoma. And I chose to ask Don to come on because of all your great work that you're doing in the Parrot Project. You're making a lot of progress. Thank um, you. Yep, yep, with all your birds. And you're showing how whenever we talk about something, um, a particular topic like target training or whatever, it's applying across the board with um, a variety of birds you have. How many birds right. do you have, Dawn? Thirteen. Okay. I've got uh, four cockatoos and macaw and then several little, you know, Conyers, Quaker, Lorkey. Okay. So I've got you a bunch. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you do not rehome. You're pretty much just, you just rehab and train. Right. Um, I used to foster years ago and adopt out and do the whole rescue thing. Now I primarily, um, I network for the rescues, donate to them, help them fundraise, that kind of thing. And then I have taken in a few fosters occasionally to rehab um, that already had homes and send them to their home. Then once, you know, either they're trained, weaned, whatever the case may be. Uh, get them ready for their new home. So, yeah, yeah, and um, a lot of people know who you are as in the parrot community as well, Dawn. Um, I can tell because um, different times I post different things about you. People, people recognize you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm all over Facebook all the time. So, <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks for um, joining today, Dawn. Thank you. And then we have Ashley Nally. Um, who is a professional doggy doggy trainer? Professional <laughs> dog trainer. <laughs> with, I'm thinking with doggy do right. Um, and you're based out of. Aren't you in Indiana? Yes. Yeah, you're, we're in Indiana. You're my neighboring state. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It, no excuses not to come visit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're at the Clicker Expo right now, aren't you? Uh, we only stayed on Friday and Saturday. Okay. So we left last night. I'm back home. Okay. But yes, I'm going to try not to uh, flood you guys with information because I feel flooded myself with information after going through Clicker Expo. Is that your first Clicker Expo? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and we listen to uh, Kid Ramirez speak every opportunity we had. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been to one. It was been. It's probably been about four or five years ago. Um, it was enjoyable. I got to. It, it was nice because you get, you get you get to do a lot of networking. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, and Ashley, you're with Doggy Do Right. How long have you been with them? I have been there three years, I believe. I've been training for at least two years. 
Um, and I've been playing with Dr. Sarah Bennett, who's a veterinary behavior specialist. I train with Sarah, who's the other trainer owner there. Owner there. And, um, yeah, we teach, you know, anything from puppy, puppy class up to uh, some advanced classes. Okay, great. Um, and then, Ashley, you are, I can tell when a professional trainer joins the memberships or the projects because they join all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've all of them. <laughs> uh -huh. And the membership. Yep, it, and that, that's been for over a year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I've been in the snow project since day one, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, what we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to pay attention. <clears throat> I'm going to pay attention to the comments. Can you guys see the comments on the, on the screen? I can't. Okay. I guess that's no my job. <laughs> <laughs> no distraction. <laughs> I'll pay attention. Um, let's see. People are saying they're getting an echo with you, Ashley, for some reason. Yeah, I thought I heard that. Is it still It's not now, but it was it was earlier, but it's not now. It sounds clear. Okay. Okay. Um all right. So what I'll do is I will pay attention to um the comments. There's a lot of people on here saying uh, hello to both of you. <clears throat> that obviously know you. Um, so I'll pay attention to the comments and um, they're saying, yeah, Ashley, that you're, you're echoing and garbling for some reason. Okay. Am okay. I still, okay. Am I still echoing? Yeah, I can hear yeah, it. I can hear it. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Let me. I'm not sure what I can do on my end. Um, Shelly wants to know what part of, Let's see. Um, do you, Ashley, happen to have a headset or earbuds? Yeah, let me go grab them. Okay. Because right somebody's, somebody's saying that it'll go away. <clears throat> okay, Dawn, so it's me and you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, we'll give it a couple seconds, wait for Ashley to come back. But, yeah, I did want to say – before I forget, let me put this up here, that it is our three-year anniversary of doing these, the Coffee with the Critters live every Sunday morning um, here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. Um, and we bring a wide variety of topics, like I try to add in, mix in um, interviews. We're gonna start doing this, what we're doing right now is the Behavior Spotlight. Um, and I usually pick a topic. I'll pick a behavior training topic. We do enrichment and um, something else, but I, I forget. <clears throat> but yeah, so this is the first time, Dawn, that I've had three people on at once. Um, I've had I've done it a couple times where I do interviews. We've had uh, Joel Vitovic on here. Uh, Jason Crean has been on here several times. Deb, Deb Jones has been on here several times. Um, so what I do is I like to find people who are doing great work and can bring great benefit to the animal community, and I interview them. So we have several months of interviews lined up. Um, so Ashley is going to plug in, and somebody else that we'll see. Ashley, you want to go ahead and test it? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. good. So... Yeah, and he says, and he says, we have a Q&A. Thanks. 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 <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead. So what we're going to discuss is um, how applied behavior analysis works across the board with numerous different animals. Um, Dawn, do you work with any other animals other than parrots? Horses. That's right. You told me that the other yeah. day. What's your hist? I know we've got Kim Wendy on here as well. She's a professional horse trainer out of Texas. Um, what's your history of working with horses, Dawn? That's one um, thing I'm afraid of. Oh no, horses! Horses are wonderful. They're they're my other favorite animal next to a parrot. Um, pr primarily, I don't want to call it breaking them, but training them to ride. Um, I never really was into disciplines like reining, that kind of thing. I did get into the hunter jumpers. Um, there for a few years and worked at a barn in Scottsdale, Arizona for a while training um, the jumper horses and stuff. But, you know, most of it's been uh, training to ride, 
correcting some unwanted behaviors or bad behaviors, um, that kind of thing. Um, and is it still, I know that <clears throat> when I give a presentation and I'm looking for examples of using negative reinforcement or positive punishment with animals, um, I just go, I just Google some horse training videos and it's, it's there's a lot, <laughs> in, a lot. In, yeah. In, even some who still say that it's, um, mostly positive reinforcement, it doesn't take long for me to sit there and watch. And I'm just like, that looks like um, escape avoidance behavior. Do it or Yeah, else. because they're a flight animal. They're just kind of, they're a prey animal, just like a bird. So, you know, their first instinct, obviously, is, is to be gone if something scares them, you know, or isn't right with them. Um, I, I, I followed a lot of well-known horse trainers when I was young, but because like you said, when you start watching them and you start seeing that the horses are trying to escape and avoid, I knew that wasn't right. So I kind of just did my own thing because I don't believe in, you know, forcing. I've always used positive reinforcement with any animal that I've ever trained. So um, I kind of just done my own thing along the way. Um, and, you know, luckily I get along with animals really well and I read body language really, really well. So um, that's really helped. So a um, uh, lot. What what was your introdu your introduction to positive reinforcement? Um, probably the treats with a horse. You're talking about with a horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be probably with a treat, food, food item. So you, you know, just I, they're very curious too. So I mean, um, if I was to step into a round pen with a horse that I never knew, you know, like I said, I might toss a few treats to them, alfalfa cubes or whatever it is that they like. If they come over to get that treat, even if it's five foot from me, I'm going to toss them another one, um, you know, and I'll work them up a little closer. And it doesn't take long for them to realize that I'm still, I'll, yeah. I'll stand still. It might be my condition. Uh, but I'll stay still and let them come in there before I do anything with them really. Don, let's give it a couple of seconds because you're freezing. And um, if you oh can, lord, that's okay. Can you hear me now. <laughs> it, it's kind of sketchy. It's coming and going. So if you start freezing, well, so feel free to refresh your screen. That that may help. But until then, we get your frozen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll pay attention to, and, and watch for when. Um, um, so that's I'm gonna have to write a note because there's something else I wanted to talk. Oh about. no! There you go. You're, you're back better. So, um, so there you go. Okay, are y'all there? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So Dawn, okay. I moved position. Maybe it was my connection. I lost Laura. Um, can you still hear me? Can you still hear me, Dawn? Obviously not. Okay. Um, so, Dawn, can you just try to refresh can you your hear me? Screen? Yep. Can you try to refresh your screen? I may need to rejoin. Okay. Um, and feel free to do that. You can click on that link and come back in, Dawn. So, Ashley. Um, yep. Shoot. <laughs> Don't cuss. We can hear you. <laughs> Ashley, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I didn't know. It. I lost Laura. I can't see anything but you. <laughs> can you hear me? She says she can't see anything but uh, me. Yeah. I can still I see. I can't hear anybody either. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Um. Ashley, will you tell her to try to exit out and come back into that link? Yeah. Can you hear me, Don? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. She says X out and then click that link and again and come back in. Okay. Um, so, Ashley, um, I know you work with a wide variety of different animals, don't you? I've, I've yes. seen you work. As of recently, yeah. Okay. Um, I started working at a shelter. 
and um, they had some pigs there. So I'm like, well, I'm in the pig project. I can just start applying this stuff. And so I started working with them. Um, I worked with birds, not many, but a few. And um, yeah, 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 parrots. Um, So I think aside from dogs, I would say that pigs and parrots are the other two that I would train. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And aren't pigs very different? Yes. They're very different. Yeah. So when I first got started training with them, I'm like, well, it's the same sort of stuff. You know, we'll just do some targeting with a target stick and see where we go. And then watching body language with them is way different. And uh, engaging with them is a lot different, too. They're very quick. So I had like a bad click in there and I'm like, oh, no. I just ruined all my training <laughs> because they catch on so fast. They do. And a lot of times, like if I'm off with my bridge, you yeah. can't, they, they learn it that fast. And yeah. I was like, oh, this is not what I wanted you to do. But now yeah. you learned it and they keep reverting back to it. Yeah. Um, have you also seen, like I tell people with pigs that um, they, it's very easy for them to train you. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize you're being trained until you're like, oh, wow, you're training me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was one pig that I was working with, and this was the first one I worked with. And uh, she kept backing up away a little bit. And I think she was doing that because she had some, um, you know, ag- aggression in her kennel, basically, that she was staying in. And uh, she'd back up a little bit, and I'd toss a couple treats, you know, just kind of counter conditioning me being there. And um, what I realized was I was teaching her to back up away from me and that she would get food for doing so because I toss her a couple pieces of Cheerios. That's um, what you they were trying to teach her? No, <laughs> okay. no. So I was working on target training with her, but then I was like accidentally teaching her to back up and I didn't realize I was doing it. Um, just making sure she was comfortable with me being there and training with me. So I'm watching that like, Okay, I need to end training. Obviously, I'm accidentally training target training, backing up, <laughs> and I don't know what exactly the response was to me fully with her, but um, yeah, it, it was really interesting. Are you still working with those things? She is adopted out. Oh, good. So, yeah, and actually, they uh, transferred them to a uh, sanctuary. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So they're yeah. at a sanctuary now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be more, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you see that your training has helped them when they were relocated? Uh, I haven't followed up with the relocation yet because it's quite recent. Um, what I did see, though, was the one that they kept saying was kind of aggressive in her uh, her kennel that she was staying in. Um, when I first started engaging with her, she was jumping up at the kennel at the front of it. Um, within one training session, I had her keeping all four hooves on the ground and, you know, interacting quite happily with me. So, um, and she was also starting to follow the target through a barrier, but she was following the target back and forth when requested. So that was um, really cool to see within one session already starting to form that. Yeah. And um, because I was watching some of your work in the pig project with, with the pigs, um, I know that when I first start training an animal, if I'm not familiar with the species or I'm not, definitely if I'm not familiar with that individual animal, one of the first things I train is I just identify reinforcers and then I just walk up and if they're food reinforcers, I just walk up and continually, every time I approach the enclosure, pair myself with a positive food reinforcer. Mm-hmm. Food reinforcer. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, The next thing I train is usually um, nose, snout, or beak target Mm -hmm. because I need to be able to read that animal's body language. And that's how I do it, by asking them to touch a target stick so then I can start pairing and understanding, finding what um, that body looks like, that body language looks like in association with something that I know is of high value. So yeah. then I can start identifying what excited looks like, what frustrated looks like, um, if the animal's not catching on. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's a pretty quick and easy behavior to get with some animals. Uh, not all, of course. <laughs> I've seen your work with the parrots, and, you know, it's a whole shaping plan. Just get them to accept, um, you know, one of those lollipop targets. 
Yeah. Um, but it's also really nice too, because with the dogs um, that are a bit more reactive, you can have that target stick. So you can still be teaching a behavior. You can still be um, teaching those condition reinforcers and using them, but you also have a barrier of sorts, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I immediately it's toss a couple treats, make sure you're comfortable with me. And then we go into target training. Yeah. Um, and I've had to use that. Let me try to get Dawn back on here because I want to talk okay. to her about some, see if this is going to happen or not. I'm here. I had to move. So hopefully, and I'm holding my camera. So hopefully it's not too shaky. Yep. <laughs> um, Cause I really was hoping you could get back in here, Dawn. Cause I wanted to talk yeah. to you about horses. Um, because when talking about the use of negative reinforcement, which is getting the behavior you want, um, the animal gives you the behavior you want to escape, avoid a consequence. Um, right. Negative reinforcement is, is, will I use it? Very rarely. Um, most of the, the area where I see I may have to use it the most is in working with uh, wildlife because that animal wants nothing to do with you. So right. um, if I do use negative reinforcement, I will use it paired with positive reinforcement with the intention of dropping out the negative reinforcement. For example, um, when working with wildlife, now I'm, now I'm talking about injured wildlife that cannot be um, reintroduced into the wild. It has to stay in captivity due to its injuries. Um, I will shape the animal staying still because it is it wants nothing to do with me it's usually a, a, as far away in the enclosure as possible so i will bridge and reinforce just staying there and i know i'm using negative reinforcement the animal is would be like if i just stay here and stay still she will go away so that gives me enough time to bridge drop in a food reinforcer bam, then I go away. Then you usually see the animal come up, get the food reinforcer. I start approaching again, bam, the animal goes to the back of the enclosure. Um, I wait for, you know, a period of sitting or perching, whatever, still, bridge, reinforce. And pretty soon, um, if I do that consistently and effectively, delivering a positive reinforcer, soon I become the conditioned reinforcer, the cue, meaning the animal sees me and starts um, approaching the front of the cage. So then I know I've effectively um, paired myself with the positive reinforcer and negative reinforcement is no longer needed um, because it just, it's negative reinforcement is so damaging, can be so damaging and it doesn't build that relationship between the animal and the trainer. So with that being said, Dawn, what I was wanting to talk to you about, I know Kim Wendy's on here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see her. Um, <clears throat> she says, this is Kim, I start every horse behind a barrier. Um, I would too. <laughs> I don't think I would <laughs> get on the other side of that barrier. But with what you were talking about before we got cut out, Dawn, is if somebody was to go in with a horse, now those they they can weigh how much do they weigh oh anywhere from 800 to 1500 pounds i mean they're big animals yeah they, and one I, one kick could take your head nearly off i mean you know they're very strong big animals yeah so using negative reinforcement is one of the last things i would want to do with a horse you, you know yeah because they're going to blow up you know eventually i mean they may do what you want for six, 10, 20 times, but there's going to come a point when that's not going to work anymore and they're going to blow up. I mean, they're going to act out against it. You know, they feel, to me, it seems like forcing them. And I, like I said, I don't like forcing anything. I don't like to be forced. And, you know, somebody forces me, I'm going to, going to push against them because I don't like it. And it's the same thing for the animals. I mean, there, there's really no need in it. And plus they're so big, they can hurt you. They really yeah. hurt you. Yeah. Um, I had somebody here locally because we were talking, I was actually having a discussion with Kim Wendy, talking to her about horses. <clears throat> and um, I had mentioned that negative reinforcement is so um, huge in horse training. Even some of the more well-known, I mean, yes. that's not my area of expertise, so I don't know. Um, but 
like even some of the more popular horse training methods I've been watching. And I was like, wow, that is still so much negative reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a time and place for it. You know, if you have to use it with a horse, but you don't have to, I've trained, I can't even count how many horses I've trained them to ride. I've corrected bad behaviors, you know, um, maybe just teaching them a few simple things like how to side pass or go over a log or, you know, trail ride, not to be spooky of bags and whatever. And there, there's no need, need to be using negative negative reinforcement with them at all yeah and um so i had this one person approach me saying let me show you how we don't use negative reinforcement and i got in the arena with her but i stayed behind a barrier (laughs) this was a huge horse and i was just like i am not comfortable with this um so i put myself in a position where i was comfortable but i watched her um train she was still using a lot of negative reinforcement and she was she would bring the horse back to me and try to push the horse to get closer to me but she was pushing the horse and I was like I was just backing up I was like I don't want to be associated with that (laughs) yeah don't put me there Yeah. yeah yeah so um with that being said so we're talking about parrots pigs Horses, what other animals have we talked about? I know I work with a lot of zoo animals. Um, I love working with zoo animals because there's a wide variety. You can have 300 different species of animals, and I just go in, okay, which one are we going to train today? Um, And I do that because I like to empower them through their training. I've never, never in a million years would I thought I would be a professional animal trainer. Um, But... I, I am now because I've always loved animals and I like empowering them. Um, and I do that through the training and the enrichment. And it's the animals, animals, plural, that have shown me this is the type of interaction they like. So then I went back to school, started taking master's classes in applied behavior analysis. And I like to educate people and showing how I'm teaching people about behavior through working with animals. Um, And with both of you being in the membership and in the projects, um, like I like to, people hear the words applied behavior analysis and they're like, I can't do this. (laughs) Um, With that being said, um, were you guys familiar with applied behavior analysis before you joined the projects and the memberships? I I was not. I was, but, well, I was using it. I just wasn't fully conscious I was using it. <laughs> you know, because um, my Border Collie, Alice, is really reactive. You know, so what's the main thing that you do with a reactive dog? Um, you start managing their environment, you know, and then you start applying in a lot of uh, training with the counter conditioning, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I was using it. I just wasn't fully aware of what I was doing. Yeah. And um, I, that, I think that would probably stand true for me. I just <clears throat> I know since, you know, I started the project that I knew how to get a bit certain behavior from an animal. I knew how to train it. I didn't know the mechanics behind why I was doing a particular thing to get an animal to do a particular behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I understand and especially the small steps um, and, you know, especially I understand that. I can do this and get this behavior, but then when I hit a little block or the animal doesn't understand maybe or is getting a little frustrated, I used to, I would just back all the way up and start all over again. Now I can just tweak what I'm doing a little bit and keep going forward to get past that versus, you know, starting all over and just, you know, practice, practice, practice when I didn't need to be 10 hours of practice and I could get it done in an hour, you know, for an example. So um, the mechanics of applied analysis behavior is what, what I've gotten out of the project, I think more than anything. Yeah. And um, like a lot of what we, I mean, I haven't seen anything that we've done that's not shaping. Um, So much of what we do is everything. I didn't realize how much was shaping (laughs) until I started the project. Um, The beautiful thing about shaping though, is, you know, you can, um, I'll, I'll use my Goffins, my oldest Goffins for an example. He recalled, Recall trains, you know, we train recall. He recalls probably 60% of the time on cue, 
but he foot targets 100% of the time. So what I've done is shaped asking for a foot target into my recall when I ask him back to me as my cue. Now he recalls 100% of the time. He loves foot targeting. <laughs> I mean, that, that dude, he, every time he sees me, the foot goes in the air. You know, he's like, where's my goodie? Where's my treat? So I've used that and incorporated it into my recall training with him. So now I get him 100%, you know, coming back to me. But I've, I shaped that cue instead of the old cue, you know, but shaping, I just, I never realized how much shaping there is to training. Yeah. And then have you also seen that, um, like I know Sharon Collins is on here. She, she's from Long Island and she, her and a bunch of people from the Long Island Parrot Society were out here. And she'd asked me one time, Laura, are you ever not training? And I'm like, no, unless I'm sleeping. Then I'm not training. <laughs> But it's because once you're really aware of it, if, you know, you guys hear me say all the time, if that animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you're training it. Um, whether you realize it or not, just what are you training? Um, so, I found that with myself. Every interaction, I, I'll stop myself and say, well, wait a minute. You know, what, what kind of reaction is this going to bring if I do this? And it may be mundane stuff, you know, replacing a food bowl even. But instead of the bird being close to me, he's at the very back up there and, you know, his feathers are kind of flat and he's not looking real happy. So now I'm paying more attention. Ordinarily, I would have just put the bowl in there and closed the door and, and went on about my business. But, you know, um, I'm paying attention to a lot of the little small details, I guess you could say, with them especially. Yeah, because they are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They yeah. are. Um, animals read our body language. You know, Quincy, yep. uh, my Rottweiler, she is probably way too much in tune with my body language. That if, and, and you guys hear that if I'm out in the, in the bird room, I start getting excited during coffee with the critters, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, those animals are reading our body language. And um, one thing I was going to say, do you guys do this? I know I am very in tune. If somebody walks in the door, I'm watching what reactions the animals have. If somebody walks in the door with something in their hands, I'm constantly watching. Um, and I'm always watching for, that was a pretty awesome behavior. Is anybody going to reinforce that? And how are you going to do it? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that reinforcing when I've, I've seen the good behavior when, you know, um, we're building a shop right now. So my husband's in and out with the tool belt on one of them big contractor tool belts. And it kind of freaks the birds out when he walks back to get some water or something out of the fridge. So um, I've been waiting for him to come in and I'll. Oh, no. <laughs> <She's cutting. laughs> Don, you're cutting out again. Um, hang on um, oh, okay I hear you I hear you okay good um, right. Ashley you were getting ready to say something yeah um, like what you said which is you're watching kind of what your animals are watching for and I was training up oh she's gone I think she, she's probably going to try to come back in yeah um, but I was training up a vet visit with uh, Alice so I'm taking her to the vet uh, about once a week, and we're going in, we're eating some treats, we're leaving, and um, there was a time that I went in there, and typically they shut this door, because that's where the cats are, and Alice doesn't really mind cats, so they asked me when I walk in, um, do we need to shut this door and put the cats behind it, and I said, no, it won't be a problem, she walks in, she sees that door, and it was shut down, like, she didn't want to eat, she didn't want to respond to cues, so, and, and I saw it, because she's looking at it, and I'm going, you know, watch me sit, things like that. And she's like, mm -mm. and she's just staring at that door. So uh, we walked out and, um, you, you know, but that that's an example of you have to be watching what your animals are watching because she didn't care about the cat. She didn't care about the, the um, vet techs walking around. It was the door. The door. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that's the importance. And um, a lot of times I say never assume that mm -hmm. you're going to be comfortable or not be comfortable. Um, something just happened yesterday. Oh, it was in the Parrot Project um, with Barbara Amsler and her African Grey. Mm -hmm. Did you see that post? Mm -hmm. uh, she said she didn't. She moved the cage and didn't realize um, what a huge difference that would make in getting calm behavior from Daisy, her her Grey. That was, yeah. and that's and that's another reason why I always suggest to people 
don't stop experimenting. Yeah. Um, because when you experiment, that is when you will find different positive reinforcers or potential punishers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of kicking myself because um, my pappy on Miko, he's, he's typically crated every night. And um, we decided we'd start letting him stay out. And, you know, we had issues like we'd go and cue him to go into his crate and it would be evening time and um, he would, he would growl a little bit. And, you know, he, you could tell he was uncomfortable. And so I'm thinking I have to train the crate and I have to make sure there's nothing outside that's punishing behavior. And, um, you know, I'm looking at this from like this huge training angle of what can I do to make him more comfortable going in at night. And, um, there was one night we let him stay out and he was doing other stuff too. Like it would hit like six o'clock in the evening and he would, his noise reactivity, uh, issues would start flaring up, you know, every little noise he'd start barking at again. And, um, we let him stay out one night and I'm not recommending this for everyone. I'm just saying for him personally, um, you know, we let him stay out and, and the next morning, you know, okay, whatever. So, uh, we decided we'd do it again. And all of those behaviors, the reactivity towards noises at night, uh, the growling, if we would st start approaching in the evening, um, you know, waking up at four o'clock in the morning and, and barking, things like that, gone, you know, and he's not resource guarding the bed from anybody. You know, you can just tell it's such a, an adjustment in his environment that made him more comfortable. So now he stays out at night because it's not worth <laughs> it's not worth putting him through that stress. But, um, yeah, just changing it even slightly was huge for him. Yeah, um, that's good to hear because it sounds like maybe the crate was flooding. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I didn't realize it because he would just he would still walk in. I'm thinking, is it the crate? Is it something going on outside? You know, it. You you know he he has issues. <laughs> you never know fully what's going on with him, but yeah, um, I I realize after he that change in his behavior, I'm like, hmm, you know, that crate probably wasn't a good idea this entire time. Yeah, so it's all about the individual. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna try to bring Dawn back in. Sorry, I live in the country, and sometimes my connection can be just. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> That's okay. You're, um, Maybe I, I like leaving in and out, you know, dramatic exit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're uh, intermittent reinforcement for the coffee with the creators. <laughs> yes, it is that. I keep coming back. Hit that join button. <laughs> so um, we were talking about, and if anybody has any questions, if you guys have any questions you want um, me, Dawn, or Ashley to discuss, feel free to post it. Um, I'm, I'm watching the conversations. They're tending to, um, they're chatting with each other. But um, yeah, with uh, Ashley, you saying your Miko has issues. Um, we get people that this is why our doors are locked here at the center. People want to come in, um, and I tell people we are an educational center. We are not a zoo. Mm -hmm. We're not a petting zoo. <laughs> this yeah. This can be a very dangerous place for somebody to be who doesn't, uh, who isn't aware. Um, such, such as body language, we get a lot of people, well, we don't get a lot of people, but of the people that come to our front door, all of our doors are locked. Um, and then we're like, oh, look at the turkey vulture. And I'm like, yeah, you don't want to be. Yeah. <laughs> she turkey. looks cute, but no. <laughs> and they're like, oh, look, she's she wants to play. And I was like, um, define play because yeah. um, you will be her enrichment if you come on the other side of this door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be anything you like. <laughs> but um, people will say, wow, you know, because I need to keep control of the people. Um, as soon as that door opens, I need to have 100% control over that person because they're going to, as you guys both know, they can quickly reinforce undesired behavior that I've, and taking months to change. Yeah. Um, that's why my husband's not allowed in the center. <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of that at home too. It's like, no, stay away from them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and here's a good topic to discuss because a lot of times, um, once 
you're training people. I have to use applied behavior analysis with the people. And I'm sure Don or uh, Ashley, you see this all the time in, in what you do. Um, Don, I'm sure you do as well. I do, yeah. Yeah, but if somebody walks in this door and wanting me to train their animal, and I have had people come in with shock and prong collars on, and um, like the different, some different people will be like, oh, they can't come in, they have a shock or prong collar on. It's like, I, I'm not going to tell them what they cannot do because okay. then I've lost my opportunity to educate. So I bring them in, and um, I'll, I won't say anything about it. Um, I did this with somebody that came here for a workshop. She was um, here to – she wanted to become a professional bird trainer. So she was talking about uh, the shot collar she has on her dog. And we were sitting there training the fish, and I was like, oh, yeah, how's that working for you? So I have to <laughs> – I have to <laughs> – I have to use applied behavior analysis with the people. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you tell them what they cannot do. They are they already start to put up this barrier. They get yeah. very defensive, and and understandably so. I don't want somebody telling me what I can't do and that I'm doing things incorrectly. Or no, not right off the bat like that. No. <laughs> yeah. So by the end of the workshop. Um, I kept her dog in mind throughout the workshop by the end of the workshop. And I said, How, what are you going to take away from this that you think, do you think you could do something different with your dog? And she said, absolutely. And she shot some video of, and sent it back to me after she went home walking her dog loosely on a leash with no shot collar. Because I'm just like, awesome. are you the behavior? <laughs> um, and she's like, no, the dog still pulls. And I was like, okay, so why well, can, why not try a different method? Well, yeah. You know, I, we were listening to Ken Ramirez uh, at Clicker Expo, and, you know, he said, are you punishing the dog or are you actually punishing behavior? You know, and, and, and punishing not as in, like, scolding the dog every time he does something bad, but, you know, is that behavior decreasing and happening? And um, he said, or are you just getting mad at the dog? And, you know, it's not as beneficial, so... Yeah, it, it's one of those things, like you said, you can't just be like, hey, stop doing this and stop doing that with the people because they do get defensive. It's try this, try that, and they start seeing how easy it is, and they go, huh, that kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, and um, a lot of times what I'll do is say, okay, you know, because I really hesitate in saying dogs are more resilient because it's all up to the individual. Because I've seen some dogs, I'm like, they're not so resilient. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm like, okay, this may work on this animal. How are you going to use that with the turkey vulture that's 30 feet up in the rafters? Mm -hmm. um, or how are you going to use this? Um, um, I was just talking with somebody on Facebook the other day about some alligator training. Um, of course you were. Yeah. <laughs> Did we have any doubt? <laughs> There's a fellow trainer and a former volunteer here, Christy Skinkiss, who I used to train with at a zoo, and we trained the alligators. And I was like, we can do this. And she's like, I don't understand how. And I was like, we would pull up buckets and sit out to the side of the alligator enclosure. Um, and I'm like, behavior doesn't lie. And she goes, every time I walk by the alligator enclosure, they're climbing up the side of the, the side of the cage and I'm, or the enclosure. And I was like, something's reinforcing that. There's a reason that alligator is doing that. So we started paying attention. She was there all week. And I was like, start paying attention to what everybody's doing. And what would happen is when people would walk by the enclosure, if, um, say, the kookaburras didn't finish eating their mice, they would grab them and toss them into the alligator enclosure. Um, <clears throat> so then we had to take those two alligators. Um, the one alligator was giving us the behavior we wanted, which was just staying there and waiting until the food was presented. The other one was the one that was climbing. So we trained the one that was climbing to station and we would reinforce. And we started that by, um, I would reinforce low underneath the enclosure gate. So there was a reason for the alligator to want to keep all four feet on the ground. Um, and I like to show people 
the different animals to show how applied behavior analysis works across the board. Um, so yeah, a lot of times when I start telling people uh, showing how applied behavior analysis works, it's the science of common sense. People are like, oh, I knew that. It's a eureka moment. Eureka. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? When you start understanding how to use it, it's like, I knew that. I just didn't know how to get there. Yeah. Or I wasn't aware of this something I'm doing is bringing the consequence from the animal, what the animal's getting from it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, breaking down behavior is hard. You know, it's hard for us as trainers, let alone people who uh, have, you know, a lot of emotional investment in it. You know, your dog's jumping at um, all your guests, you know, or, yeah, your parrot's biting you every time you go to get them out of the uh, enclosure that they're in, things like that. You know, you look at that and it's hard to break down behavior and see what's reinforcing it. How can we change it? And once you start applying it, they start going, oh, yeah, that does work. But breaking it down <laughs> is difficult. Yeah. 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 And something I also say is you don't learn from easy. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the animals I bring in here to work with and show via our live streams are ones that are very challenging for me. Um, like. I mean, the porcupine wasn't too challenging. It, she was pretty easy, but um, I yeah, didn't. But snow. <laughs> yes, yeah, snow. Snow is a big challenge, yeah. Yes, snow is, snow, and for those that don't know, snow is our deaf and blind border collie. Um, she is a huge challenge, and she's been one of my best teachers. She really has, because I'm like, how am I going to communicate with this dog that cannot see and cannot hear me? Um, so... But once I start watching her and observing her, and you guys have seen in um, the projects and stuff how she runs, she'll do that run. Like people will look at that and say, "Oh, she's so happy," and it's like she's look, she's searching <gasps> information. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's running something, and um, that running gets pretty what people would call obsessive. <clears throat> so, and a lot of times with snow. Um, like you've seen her, she'll spin. Um, it's it's already happening, <laughs> you know. Um, and I was told once that starts, it's hard, it's hard to change, hard to stop, and, and it is. But if you constantly touch her, let her know where you are, one thing you don't want to do with her is leave a room and not tell her, not let her know that you're leaving. Then you'll start seeing the room, you know, she's – always searching for information. And if you're touching her and asking her what to do, um, she calms down so fast and you can see her being content with that. Um, okay. With that being said, anything else you guys want to talk about? Um, with, you know, since you've been in the projects and the memberships, um, do you see a lot that you can do different in, even in the lives of yourself and um, the work with different people, with people? Yeah. I, know. I mean, it changed oh. the way that I interact with people. <laughs> I think it gave me a lot more um, empathy for some situations. Yep. You know, it taught me a uh, different way how to how to teach people, definitely in classes, but also how I handle situations. Um, you know, yes, there's a level of control, but you can't always have control. So shaping other people to, um, I don't want to say agree with you, but, <laughs> you know, get them on the same page as you um, or understand at least your viewpoint on things. Um, yeah, it, it taught me a lot of how to do that with people and then how I can start you know, you know if you change the person you can start changing the behavior of the animal so. and you have to get to that person yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'd have to agree with Ashley I mean I, I found that with the people too you know that um, just a different approach you know a softer approach maybe I guess you would call it um, to get them even though it might be something that's really horrible and needs to be changed immediately you know like you said you can't just go in there and say, no, 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 you can't do this. Um, but with that softer approach, you know, um, I know that I've helped, gosh, I don't know how many people keep their birds in their homes versus giving them up to a rescue. 
for simple behaviors, maybe a little excessive screaming or biting or, um, you know, some cage aggression, whatever it is. Um, I've kind of talked them through it, gave them some simple tasks, you know, that I've learned in the projects like target training and um, some different enrichment and that kind of thing. And so far we've been able to keep the birds home a little longer. You know, I'm hoping that's a long-term situation and it may or may not be, but um, I do a lot of rescue work and I see birds given up for just really simple reasons often. And, and there are things that can be changed and changed pretty easily. So, um, you know, but it starts with the people. You've got to train the people yeah. to train the animals. Well, so, yeah. And kind of to touch on what you said, no matter what you're training, you're opening up a line of communication. So mm-hmm. the first thing I taught with um, my other Papillon Leo, I taught him to wave. You know, I, I treated him a couple times for a sit and then it was um, – you know, bridging and reinforcing for paw lifts until it was a wave and I could put it on cue. And um, because I think most people think, you know, you have to dial it back down to the basics every time we start. And, um, you know, straight from that, I remember going into teaching uh, with leash banners for school because he had to have different things. And um, I think, you know, leash banners is something obviously a little more higher up on that criteria, but it opened a line of communication between the two of us of, you know, if I ask behaviors out of you or if I'm bridging and reinforcing behaviors out of you, you know what to expect out of me. Therefore, it makes it more reliable of what I know to expect out of him um, and other animals. Yeah. Have you found, I, I know that I've found too that that communication when I do ask a new behavior or for something new for my animal, they're not, they don't shy away as quickly and they pick it up just like that. I mean, it's, it's, of course, you know, like I said, we've got a history now and a foundation mm-hmm. of, communication so um i don't know maybe we're reading each other a little bit better or yeah. whatever it is but it, it seems like i can teach new things in a, just a flash i mean in no mm-hmm. time at all well, no it, time at all and because it's fun and well the fine fun um <laughs> <laughs> i think it's fun i don't know about them but <laughs> i think it's fun um you'll see the animal want to engage and interact more because there's good things that happen when when they when they do Um, so it's a great way to, I mean, a lot of people don't like to use the word control, but it is, it's all about manipulation and control, um, for better well-being of the future of that animal. Um, So you make it fun for the person, for the people, then they want to train more Mm -hmm. once they see how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, with that, I, I know there's a couple of people have had some questions, so um, we're pretty much out of time. Um, but Dawn and Ashley, uh, I encourage you that after this live stream is over, you know, wh- whenever, um, to go back and feel free to go through the comments and, and respond to some people because some people have been asking stuff, particularly of uh, the both of you, and I just didn't want to interrupt your conversation. So, um, okay. I want to thank you both very much for coming on here with me today. Um, for those of you that want to get in touch with Ashley, here is her email address. Um, because I know, I think it was Tim had asked for contact information for both of you. So feel free to go back and comment so you can reach Ashley there. Um, if anybody wants to know more information about what we do here at the animal behavior center, here's our website, the animal And you can always reach me personally via my email address, Laura at the animal behavior center.com. So um, with that being said, I don't want to boot you guys off the screen, no, but-, but thank you for having me. No, thank but, you. Yeah, thank you, too, for having me also. Yes, thank you both so much. <laughs> and uh, we lost on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much. And great work you're doing in the projects, in the membership. Um, so, okay. With that being said, um, happy anniversary to Coffee with Critters. Thank you both for coming, and we'll see you guys next week on Coffee with the Critters. All right, take care.